So over the weekend, politicians in both parties released statements in response to Hamas's attack on Israel. And in my opinion, almost all of them missed the mark with a few exceptions. And we're going to talk about that because I think that what U.S. politicians say is important given how much influence America has in that region. But having said that, though, I do want to first look at the events that unfolded on Saturday. And as Common Dreams reports, Hamas launched a surprise operation on an unprecedented scale against Israel early Saturday by land, air and sea. Hamas's military chief, Mohammed Deif, said the operation was codenamed Al-Aqsa Flood. The day marks a tremendous strategic failure and defeat for Israel, even as it bombs Gaza in retaliation. The Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza says the death toll of the ongoing Israeli attacks on Gaza has risen to 198, with 1,610 injured. And Israel's Channel 12 reports that the Israeli death toll has risen to at least 40, and more than 740 people have been injured. Now keep in mind that all of these numbers are subject to change, and it's very difficult to track these kinds of things as it happens, but just know that there's a lot of people who are suffering right now, and it's a very uncomfortable, nauseating thought, but that is the reality. So we're not going to focus too much on specific numbers, but the situation is very, very sad. Now, even though this all may feel sudden to international observers, tensions have been escalating all year in the lead up to this outbreak of violence. As the Washington Post explains, as of September 19th, before Saturday's outbreak of violence, 227 Palestinians had been killed by Israeli troops or settlers this year, according to UN figures, with most of those deaths, 189, occurring in the West Bank. At least 29 Israelis, mostly in the West Bank, were also killed this year as of the end of August, according to the same UN database. Now, to zoom out even a bit further, the violence from this year also has not occurred in a vacuum, and that context is absolutely crucial. Now, as this graphic demonstrates, Palestine has been quickly disappearing with more land being illegally annexed and occupied by Israel's far-right government every single year. In fact, Amnesty International declared this a system of apartheid and for very good reason. Every single year, more and more Palestinians are forcibly evicted from their homes and displaced. They're segregated and they have no civil rights, no civil liberties. And in Gaza, the situation is even worse. As Common Dreams explains, Israel has been imposing a land, air, and sea blockade on the Gaza Strip for nearly two decades, impoverishing much of the crowded enclave's population and denying millions sufficient access to clean water and other necessities. Children who make up roughly half of Gaza's population have been disproportionately affected. So we're talking about a very young population in a densely populated area that is now being bombed again. And already before this current outbreak of violence, people in Gaza had no economic prospects. Unemployment was above 40%. They're effectively living in the world's largest open-air prison where no one can leave or enter without Israel's permission. And this was already a humanitarian disaster, but that problem is going to be exacerbated because of this current wave of bombing. I mean, more than half of Gazans already needed aid. 3% didn't have access to potable water. And now that's going to get worse. But if you are a Gazan, Resisting this blockade was literally, is literally a matter of life and death. But the problem is that there's just no good options for resisting. Because when they resist using violence, obviously, Israel responds predictably with even more violence. But when they resist peacefully and they protest, they're still brutalized. In fact, you can't even peacefully resist here in the United States because the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement is banned in dozens of U.S. states. So we're not even allowed to advocate for peaceful resistance here in many states. So we're in this horrible situation, and it looks like there's no end. There's a power imbalance here, and only one side can choose to end apartheid, choose to end all the suffering, and that is Israel. And as long as Israel chooses to maintain this brutal system of oppression and subjugation and apartheid, peace is never going to be possible. And this is what politicians have to acknowledge. You can't just look at what happened in a vacuum. You have to zoom out and look at the entire set of circumstances here and understand that this sort of violence is inevitable. And as this graphic demonstrates, violence has been common in the region for decades. But one side always suffers disproportionately, and that is because they lack power, they lack resources, whereas the other side has all the power, all the resources, not to mention international support. And that's why we always see the same result. Now, having said that, does this justify Hamas's slaughter of innocent Israelis? 
Absolutely not. Targeting civilians is a war crime. It's never okay. It's bad regardless of who does it. And I hope that people condemn the slaughter of innocent civilians because that is not okay. And it's really important to remember as we see these news stories here that we shouldn't conflate the actions of Hamas with the actions of all Palestinians. And in the same breath, we shouldn't conflate the actions of the far-right Israeli government with the actions of Israel citizens. And I say this because my country, the United States, has done horrible things. It is a colonizer country. We invaded Iraq when I was just a young man, couldn't vote yet. And I think probably many, if not most, Americans supported that. But I didn't. But we were lied to. There was a lot of propaganda. So I think that even though in a de democratic situation you can elect your government, you still in the end don't have total control of what your government does. And in the same way that I wouldn't want to be blamed for the actions of my government, for the atrocities of my government, even if I am indirectly responsible because my tax dollars funded, I wouldn't want people to view Palestinians as responsible for the actions of Hamas in the same way I wouldn't want people to view Israelis responsible for the actions of their government. When it comes to war, we've got to remember that people are people and human life is precious. And that's one thing that I want people to understand. Now, I've seen people compare this to 9-11 and say that this is Israel's 9-11. But if they think that that is indeed the case, then there's a lesson that they should learn. Because on 9-11, 3,000 Americans tragically died, but over a million people in the Middle East that had nothing to do with that perished in response. And with the way that things are going, it seems like Israel is gearing up for a similar response, which is horrifying. In fact, the defense minister of Israel, Yov Gallant, said the following. So they're cutting off electricity, food, water, and gas to people he deems as animals. Now ask yourself this question. Do you think that he's referring exclusively to Hamas here? Because even if he is, the fact that he's telling you that all 2 million plus people in Gaza are going to lose power and water, that tells you everything you need to know about this power dynamic. The situation is untenable. I mean, imagine if a government that you couldn't vote for controlled your access to food, water, power, and you weren't allowed to leave ever unless you got their permission. You couldn't view your family. Or imagine if you were evicted from the home that your family lived in for generations at gunpoint. You had no choice, but you had to leave and you were displaced. I mean, this situation is obviously going to foster resentment. You would be very mad. You would want to retaliate. So this situation creates an environment where tensions are always going to be hot. Because when you are putting people in this predicament, they're going to want to resist. And the reason why a fascist like Benjamin Netanyahu keeps getting elected is because he's promising to keep Israelis safe. But he's been lying to them. And year after year, that lie becomes more apparent because so long as the system of apartheid exists, violence like this is going to continue to occur. And innocent Palestinians, as well as innocent Israelis, are going to continue to suffer and lose their lives. And again, life is precious. Every single person deserves to live a life with dignity and peace. But that is not possible so long as this current system is in place, right? It's only possible if Israel ends its illegal occupation of Palestine and people get real about actual solutions. A two-state solution is dead. Nobody wants to admit that. I mean, how are you going to do a two-state solution when Palestine has essentially been erased? The only feasible solution at this point seems to be a one-state solution with equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis. But Israel is able to perpetuate this system of apartheid and segregation because countries like the United States, colonizers ourselves, they allow it to continue, right? And so long as we allow it to continue, it will continue because there's no reason for Israel to stop doing what they're doing, right? So this is why I do want to take some time to focus on what U.S. politicians are saying because I think that their takes are important here. What they say 
matters. It reverberates around the world. Now, many politicians condemned Hamas's attack and rightfully expressed sadness for the lives lost in Israel, yet they failed to mention the humanitarian disaster taking place in Gaza that created these conditions, and they kind of like talk about this without giving you the full context. Others, namely Republicans like Nikki Haley, use this attack by Hamas to effectively justify genocide against Palestinians with rhetoric that is overtly fascistic. So needless to say, I was very disappointed by what a lot of lawmakers said. Uh, there are a lot of them that frame this as unprovoked, an unprovoked attack, when that's obviously not true. But there were a couple of exceptions. A couple of lawmakers who said something that stood out because they gave people the full context. But of course, they were attacked for it. But before we get to that, let's look at what they said. First and foremost is Congresswoman Cori Bush, who released the following statement on Twitter. Quote, I am heartbroken by the ongoing violence in Palestine and Israel. I mourn the over 250 Israeli and 230 Palestinian lives that have been lost today and the thousands injured. Following attacks by Hamas, militants on Israeli border towns and Israeli military bombardment of Gaza. I strongly condemn the targeting of civilians and I urge an immediate ceasefire and de-escalation to prevent further loss of life. Our immediate focus must be saving lives, but our ultimate focus must be on a just and lasting peace that ensures safety for everyone in the region. Violations of human rights do not justify more violations of human rights, and a military response will only exacerbate the suffering of Palestinians and Israelis alike. As part of achieving a just and lasting peace, we must do our part to stop this violence and trauma by ending U.S. government support for Israel Israeli military occupation and apartheid. Now, on Instagram, the only Palestinian American member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, also released a statement that was similar, saying, I grieve the Palestinian and Israeli lives lost yesterday, today, and every day. I am determined as ever to fight for a just future where everyone can live in peace without fear and with true freedom, equal rights, and human dignity. The path to that future must include lifting the blockade ending the occupation and dismantling the apartheid system that creates the suffocating, dehumanizing conditions that can lead to resistance. The failure to recognize the violent reality of living under siege, occupation, and apartheid makes no one safer. No person, no child anywhere should have to suffer or live in fear of violence. We cannot ignore the humanity in each other. As long as our country provides billions in unconditional funding to support the apartheid government, this heartbreaking cycle of violence will continue. Now, I think that these were really good statements, right? They condemned the violence. They're not saying, yes, what Hamas did, that is legitimate resistance. They're just saying the context matters here. The situation has led to this point and violence will continue if nothing changes. But the reason why these statements were so controversial is because they're calling for the United States to end aid to Israel, while others are saying we should actually increase aid to Israel. Now, after we see the responses to that, you'll understand why they think this is uh, so controversial. And spoiler alert, their interpretation of these statements are incredibly disingenuous and bad faith. But nonetheless, The Hill reports, Quote, U.S. aid to Israel is and should be unconditional and never more so than in this moment of critical need, Democrat Richie Torres said in a statement to Jewish Insider. Quote, shame on anyone who glorifies as resistance the largest single-day mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. It is reprehensible and repulsive. Furthermore, quote, two of my colleagues called for America to end resistance to Israel, despite the countless images of Israeli children, women, men, and elderly, including Americans murdered by radical Iranian-backed Hamas terrorists. Democrat Josh Gothheimer said in a statement obtained by The Hill. It sickens me that while Israelis clean the blood of their family members shot in their homes, they believe Congress should strip U.S. funding to our Democratic ally and allow innocent civilians to suffer. Now, the U.S. ambassador to Israel also chimed in on Twitter saying, how much more blood needs to be spilled for you to overcome your prejudice and unequivocally condemn Hamas, a U.S. designated terror organization. Hundreds of innocent Israeli civilians massacred in cold blood on a holy day. Babies kidnapped from their mother's arms and taken to Gaza, an 85-year-old woman in a wheelchair, and a Holocaust survivor taken hostage. Is that not enough, Rashida Tlaib? Now, what these disingenuous, bad-faith liars won't tell you is that both Tlaib and Bush are not calling for an end to aid to Israel to punish them for being attacked. They're not celebrating the violence here. They condemned it, as you saw. But what they are calling for is an end to aid, specifically to pressure Israel to end the occupation and apartheid so long-lasting peace can be secured. Our aid to the Israeli government is enabling a fascist regime that is literally facilitating a system of apartheid. But supposed left-wing politicians in America, those were Democrats, by the way, 
they're siding with the approach taken by the far right in Israel, not the left wing in the United States. But can you guess who agrees more with Tlaib? The left in Israel, because Ofer Kassif, a member of the Knesset's leftist Hadash coalition, echoed the same points made by Tlaib, saying, We condemn and oppose any assault on innocent civilians, but in contrast to the Israeli government, that means we oppose any assault on Palestinian civilians as well. We must analyze those terrible incidents, the attacks, in the right context. We have been warning time and time again, everything is going to erupt and everybody is going to pay a price, mainly innocent civilians on both sides. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, that is exactly what happened, he said. He continues, the Israeli government is a fascist government, supports, encourages, and leads programs against the Palestinians. There is an ethnic cleansing going on. It was obvious the writing was on the wall, written in the blood of Palestinians, and unfortunately, now Israelis as well, he added. So I think it's really poetic to see a Jewish Israeli politician echo what a Palestinian American politician is saying. Both of them are interested in long-term peace and stability, but they acknowledge that you can't make that a reality so long as the current situation continues. And we all know that the occupation will continue in perpetuity so long as America allows Israel to do this. But we're using our permanent seat at the UN Security Council to veto any and all resolutions that would reign in Israel, make them stop violating international law. And since we're not going to stop, they're not going to stop. And as a result, a lot of innocent people on both sides are going to continue to suffer something that the left in Israel and the United States acknowledge. But what Democrats like Richie Torres and Josh Gothheimer don't realize now is that they are on the wrong side of history. And they're going to realize that at some point, I think, right? They're going to look as foolish as the people who defended apartheid in South Africa. Might take some time, but that's where this is going, because I think more and more people are realizing that the current situation is completely unsustainable. You can't have one country control another country like this or control a group of people like this where they can't leave their access to food and drinking water is controlled and now being withdrawn it just it's not sustainable right so if you want peace the situation has to end change needs to happen now before we wrap up i do want to look at a cnn interview by dr mustafa bargadi which was actually really really good so he represents the palestinian national initiative he is not affiliated with hamas or the plo but what he says is the same thing as just a couple of u.s lawmakers who got it right and his words are crucial here because this is somebody whose experience is living under apartheid, living under the system of oppression in the West Bank. So what he says here, the context that he gives us is crucial. I represent a democratic Palestinian movement called Palestinian National Initiative, which is non-Fatah and non-Hamas. And we're, uh, we're uh, of course, I am not affiliated with Hamas. But I think this situation uh, that has evolved is a direct result of the continuation of the longest occupation in modern history. Israeli occupation of Palestinian land since uh, 1967. This is 56 years of occupation that has transformed into a system of apartheid, a much worse apartheid than what prevailed in South Africa. Uh, yes, uh, maybe Hamas did not recognize Israel, but the PLO did and the Palestinian Authority did. What did they get? Nothing. Since 2014, the Israeli governments would not even meet with Palestinians. And what you see today is a reaction to several things. First of all, settlers' terrorist attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank that has evicted already 20 communities in an act of ethnic cleansing. 248 Palestinians who were killed by the Israeli army and settlers in the West Bank, including 40 children. Attacks on the holy sites, the Muslim and Christian holy sites by Israeli extremists, as well as declaration of Netanyahu that he will liquidate the Palestinian rights and the Palestinian cause by normalization with Arab countries. And he dared even to go to the United Nations and carried in the United Nations a map of Israel, which included the whole of the West Bank, all of Gaza, all of Jerusalem, as well as the Golan Heights. He declared the annexation of the occupied territories. So of course, Palestinians turned to resistance because they see that this is the only way for them to get their rights. The question here is not about dehumanizing Palestinians as is happening and calling them terrorists. It's about asking the question, why the United States supports Ukraine 
in fighting what they call occupation, while here they are supporting the occupier who continues to occupy us. And that right there is a damn good question. It's easy for Americans to see why resistance to Russia's genocidal war in Ukraine is both just and necessary. In fact, Americans literally support violent resistance against Russia, which is why we're sending them tanks and weapons. However, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, resistance in all forms by Palestinians is deemed unacceptable. Like, put aside Hamas's attack. Dr. Bargatti is not affiliated with Hamas. He doesn't represent Hamas. But he is a Palestinian in the West Bank. He's talking about even peaceful forms of resistance being met with condemnation. If you're a Palestinian and you protest peacefully, you are brutalized. You see violence. But even if you're in the United States, peaceful support for BDS, a peaceful movement, is met with censorship, which is a violation of the First Amendment. Americans need to think deeply about why this discrepancy exists, right? What is it? Is it a racial component? Why is this double standard here? Is it just U.S. geopolitical interests? Examine why that's happening, and if you hold this bias, why you have this bias. But I do want to get back to that interview and hear some more from Dr. Bargatti, because he's going to point out this double standard even when it comes to civilian casualties. Now, to be clear, all of the casualties are bad, and I feel like it's pretty easy for people to condemn it all, because none of the suffering is good. It's it's horrible, right? But he points out that there's never the same concern for civilian casualties on the Palestinian side. People only see the harm done to Israelis, which is bad, but they never see what's happening simultaneously to Palestinians. It's just completely tuned out. I do not accept attacking any civilian. Uh, uh, I do not accept that Israelis attack our civilians. But look at what Israeli planes are doing now in Gaza. They, they are bombarding houses. They're bringing down to earth, and you've shown, you've shown that on your, uh, on your screen. Uh, whole apartments, whole buildings, high-rise buildings are brought down to the ground, and we already are reporting, uh, receiving uh, reports about families who are killed. Uh, nine people in one family, ten people in another family, including children. I do not want any civilian to be hurt, neither by Palestinians or by Israelis. But the question is how to end that. Will it end by attacking Gaza Strip another time? Israel has already conducted five wars on Gaza. One of them lasted 51 days. They destroyed everything. This did not stop Hamas, did not stop resistance. There is one way to stop any violence, and that is to end the Israeli occupation. And that is for the United States to be fair. They cannot say that Israel has the right to defend itself, but we, the Palestinians, don't have the right to defend ourselves. Let me remind you with the case of Shirin Abu Akli, who was not only Palestinian, but also an American, a very peaceful journalist. She was shot to death by an Israeli sniper. Was anybody indicted? Was anybody taken to court? No. 52 other journalists were also killed. Our first aid providers are shot at. Our doctors are shot at. This should stop. And the only way to stop it is to tell Israel, you have to respect international law, you have to end this illegal occupation, and accept Palestinians as equal human beings. Bingo. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. What he said there was really important. Now, one last clip that I want to leave you with is uh, this video that I play whenever Israel-Palestine dominates the news cycle. It's a clip of the late, great Michael Brooks, who explains that his Jewish values teach him to oppose apartheid. And on top of that, he explains that the situation isn't actually that complicated, even though mainstream media might present it as complicated in actuality, it's pretty simple. And I'm gonna leave you with his words of wisdom. So it's not a complex issue. That's the big thing, it's super simple. There's one group that has enormous power, it's the most powerful country in the Middle East, it's backed by the United States, it acts on another population of people with total impunity and is never held accountable for anything. So there's no symmetry in the relationship, period. And just as like a thought experiment, IDW people, if we know that if somehow a population of Jewish refugees ended up in West Bank in Gaza and an Arabic government in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv had an open air prison in, in what, you know, Jewish Gaza, which they bombed with white phosphorus, they killed civilians indiscriminately and they had no uh, provisions for medicine 
They had an embargo that blocked food, that the electricity wasn't running, that there was an over 48% unemployment rate, life expectancy and malnutrition statistics were horrifying. The, uh, one of the major uh, policy makers in this hypothetical Arabic Palestinian state said, we need to put those Jews on a diet. In the West Bank, there was another Jewish area where there was a little bit more autonomy, but there was regular Arabic settlements where they pulled up the Jewish farmers' foods, they terrorized them with rocks, the security forces broke children's bones, and they couldn't drive on their own roads. We'd all have no problem understanding what that was. So there's nothing complex about it. The second part of your question, it's, it's a pure asymmetry relationship. And the question is rights or not. So that's it, it's not complicated. The second part of your question, at this point, there's always been, there's always gonna be crackpots who are anti-Semitic who condemn Israel. That's not what drives the movement, it's particularly in the United States. If you work around most people who are concerned with this issue, it's actually populated with a lot of Jewish people. The real question we have to ask is why is it that APAC is hosting a information minister for Slobodan Milosevic? Why is it that there's relationships between the Israeli government and far-right parties in Europe? Why is it that Benjamin Netanyahu's son is posting borderline alt-right memes? Why is it that Israel is an alt-right state even though it is from the descendants of the victims of one of the greatest crimes in history? That's a serious question, and that's inseparable from the racism of the project, which goes back to the first part that we have to solve. But thank you. Shalom.